Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. Did you know advanced high strength steels are the leading material used by automakers to achieve the new fuel economy standards? Advanced high strength steels are lighter in weight and reduce greenhouse gas emissions without compromising safety, performance, or affordability. Steel, a sound, sustainable investment. Today, tomorrow, and beyond. For more information, visit autosteel.org. You know why I pulled you over, ma'am? I need you to recalibrate the Doppler shift on the return signal. Radar's on the frisk. Do Sonata drivers know something you don't? The Sonata from Hyundai. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. We're going to be talking about all the different trends that are going on at the retail end of the business, both used and new. And joining me on today's show are Steve Finley, the editor of Ward's Dealer Business, part of the WardsAuto.com empire. We also have Ron McEachern, the general manager for the Suburban Collection, a number of retail outlets in the, in the business. And Ricky Beggs, uh, the editor of Black Book, part of Hearst Publishing. Do I have that right, editor? You got that right. Okay. Glad to be here. Ricky, well, and glad having all of you here, too. <laughs> Thank you, John. Ricky, let's start off with uh, the used car part of the business. It's been extraordinary what's gone on there, because with the big collapse, as I call it, when we saw GM and Chrysler go through bankruptcy and the whole car market collapse, they didn't build a whole lot of cars, so there's been a shortage in the used car market. Has the industry started to fill that up, or has the business started to fill that up? Where, where do we stand now? You know, you're exactly right. There has been a shortage in the market, and that's what's caused used prices to absolutely go crazy, unbelievably strong over the last three to four years. And even up until probably the mid-May of this year, we've had an unusually strong used car market. Then we've started seeing a little easing off. My con of address of seeing this used car market, why has it started to soften, is the fact that there is a little more supply coming into the marketplace now. Look at the new car sales that are, are at this year's level versus last year's level and the increase that we're seeing. So that's a driver of, of the adjustment in the marketplace right now. Ron, do you see that at your stores, is that there's an easing off of used car prices? I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a supply and demand issue. Uh, we also have with the, uh, you know, the new cars leasing coming back, it becomes an affordability, a shopping issue. We had a lot of customers before that were looking to stay in a certain payment zone that couldn't be accomplished with a new car. So you had a kind of a double whammy of less supply because of what was just mentioned and, you know, the high demand because of affordability. But uh, we're starting to see now with the new car business growing, we're starting to see uh, more trade-ins coming to the dealership and, and the supply getting better, but the trade-ins are a lot different than they were five years ago. That's in what way? What are they doing? Well, you're seeing more high mileage cars coming in, a little older cars that people have held on to a little bit longer. So uh, there's a good market for those cars, but uh, we're anxiously awaiting to this next cycle of lease returns start coming into the dealership and we can start getting more late model cars. Well, you know, I, I think there's two other factors that, that you guys mentioned in terms of why used car prices were so successful and high when they were. Is, as you say, about 9 million potential used cars were taken out of the system when, you know, 2008 and 2009, new car sales just went to heck in a handbasket. Uh, you know, every uh, used car starts out as a new car. So you had that, but then you also had, John, um, a lot of people uh, ran into some financial difficulties during the recession, job losses, you name it, and they were former new car customers that were looking at used cars out of necessity um, because of the, the price. And then the third thing is uh, dealers really got their act together in learning how to sell used cars effectively. Not that they didn't before, but they made it a core competency to market and sell used what, cars. What'd you do differently, Ron? Is that right, what Steve's saying? No doubt about it. Yeah, we, we had to find that revenue stream somewhere that was gone with the new car business. So we, we you know, what, ourselves personally, what we did is we went out and benchmarked all the best performing used car dealers in the country to try to figure out what they were doing. So. Uh, What'd you and, learn? And I mean, what kind of well, practices? Well, basically what we learned is that it, there's a lot of things that were going on at this particular time. There's also this, this introduction, this internet, the strength of the internet. Uh, it was never, it, it ended up being a tool being used by consumers that we never saw it, it, them using. We always thought they were going to be buying the cars, not necessarily documenting their purchase as, as they have. So um, that's what we did primarily is try to make sure that, um, you know, we had the right cars that were available 
priced right in the marketplace and then advertised in the right location. And then when, they, when we finally got them as a lead, we tried to alter our, our process at the, at the dealership to match what they've been doing online, which has been very transparent, non-confrontational, easy, simple, available. And we try to match that up at the dealership level on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I think the dealers that saw the most success were the ones that made those transformations to go to more of a market-based pricing because the consumers, that's what they're finding on the internet, and then making sure that the process at the dealership was hassle-free and inviting as well. Ricky, and, uh, sorry. And where Ron was talking about the, the customer coming in, being more knowledgeable and so forth, I think Ron has a product that we have called Black Book Online, which is a lead generation tool. It gives a chance for a customer to find out what a real trade value is. Uh, not just this, your car's worth this much money, but it's going to be in this range depending on condition, depending on uh, uh, equipment that's on the vehicle. So it gives a chance for a customer to come in, meet with Ron and his staff that says, you know, I'd like to trade this car in. I think it's worth somewhere between here and here. And it doesn't put Ron in an adversarial position with the consumer. Consumer is educated on a really good value. And I think that's a tool that you use that, yeah. has, that has helped. It's really changed, uh, you know, from, for the real successful used car dealers, they've almost moved away from this old process of negotiation and gone to using tools like the Black Book Online of documentation, where here's all the information, this is what your car is worth, if the dealers have a good website, this is your pre-approval through your financing, these are your options for lease and or finance, this is the availability of the car, you know, and, and they, they come down, by the time we get to see them, they're further down the purchase funnel and they have all these answers uh, for all their questions and then it becomes, what's the dealership gonna do? What's the relationship gonna be with the dealer and how well was the car inspected if it was a used car? And how, how are you gonna take care of me in service? And that's where the real connection has to happen now for, for the uh, dealerships. Well, that's the power of the internet where basically everybody has a pretty good idea of what that car is worth and so they're priced accordingly. You don't have to be the lowest price in town, but you have to be competitive, right. especially if somebody is uh, using the internet, um, you know, third party website by price. And if you're seventh or eighth on the page of clicks, forget it, you're not even in the market. So you gotta be, uh, you know, in that first page, second page possibly. Um, and the dealership's attitude is, uh, you know, price them to sell, you know, where you're turning the inventory. You're just not having these cars on a lot, hoping some customer is going to come in, not know what the price is worth, overpay for the, the car. That doesn't happen anymore. You, you, your car is just sitting there aging, and an aging car on, on, on a lot is bad news, and dealers losing money. So, like I say, it's almost a revolution that's going on where the customer knows, the dealer, you know, has the, the tools to price that car accurately w within uh, market demands, and, and then you just turn that inventory, and that's how you make your money, not on these home runs that uh, used to be sort of the way to do business before. And it's not a one-size-fits-all either. What if you've got a, a car that's more of a commodity, or you've got more of a highline car that there's not many to choose from? So you have to price it based according to that, you know, supply, demand, are there more choices out there to go look for? So I think some of these tools help you with that as well. Is there any data that backs up what you're saying though that consumers perceive that buying a used car is a better process and maybe more trustworthy than it may have been in the past? Oh, look at CPO, certified pre-owned cars. I think that gives the consumer a lot of confidence out there in the marketplace that they're getting a good quality used car that has a warranty that's backing that up. So, so I think the confidence level there in that certified car it, is a positive for the consumer. I would argue with today's cars, you're getting a good car uh, even without certified, and yes. that wasn't the case before. If you were buying a used car 20, 25 years ago, you were taking some chances as a consumer, and well, uh, very much less so. Let's not forget the other factor out there: it's this, uh, you know, the the invention of Google reviews, you know, or or Dealer Rater or Yelp or. You know, now the consumers have a lot more power, so, you know, to your point, you know, the dealers are forced to, otherwise they're going to be dealing with issues of negative, uh, you know, reputation, uh, you know, knocks to their store uh, online. And, and a, lot of, a lot of these younger buyers now, they won't come into a dealership, so they'll do all this work online, they'll find the car that they want, and then before they come check you out, they'll put your name in and do a Google review and just see how your business is. And if you've got negative review after negative review of the used car wasn't serviced properly, I had lots of issues with it, it cost me a lot of money. 
you're not going to get a chance to talk to those customers. Ron, so do, do you folks at the Suburban Collection monitor those kinds of things? Every single day. No every kidding. Day. And do you use that as a good feedback tool, or oh, you go? Of course, if you've got a good rating, every time you have a communication, you check us out. You know, you want to see how we rank versus everybody else. And yeah, that's that's a big part of our marketing uh, right now is is reviews. There's no doubt about it. And the irony is, most dealers get pretty good reviews. Uh, you know, when you're talking four stars, five stars, uh, there was a concern on the part of a lot of dealers when this whole review thing started that oh man we're gonna get slammed by you know people mm -hmm. and especially people with an axe to grind are gonna mm -hmm. you know tear us up and that hasn't been the case people you know you got some really terrible ones and you got some really great ones and it's like anything else right in the middle is where you, where the the truth probably lies in terms of the quality of service or the, the quality of the, the store and um, I, I think about 85 percent of dealers get uh, pretty good reviews from mm -hmm. customers you know even on the on the consumer side where the consumer is more knowledgeable and goes and looks for history and so forth even on the dealer side on the wholesale side you're looking for history on that car you're looking at history reports that are out there through whether it be Carfax Auto Check or any of the any of the history reporting services as a dealer you're looking for that as well to make sure you've got a good car that doesn't have a bad history right. and bad records about it as well right. Ricky, you mentioned certified pre-owned cars. I, I think that's been another big change in the business over the last decade, isn't it? The, the OEMs paying a lot more attention to their cars, not just at the first point of sale, but farther down the road. Right. They're concerned about retention value and, and how it gives their brand strength. So they want to make sure they've got a good used car out there, and through some of those certified programs, that does that. And it, and it, it helps improve residual values, which helps improve that next lease payment and how much it's going to be. So, so that's a piece that they're all looking at. Explain that a little bit, Steve, uh, for the audience especially. How does making sure that a car is a good used car improve the residual values of a new one? Sure. Well, you know, number one, it's the perception of the quality. If the, the price is where it should be, um, then that's why BMW does so well uh, with its residuals is because they're paying attention the minute that car is, crosses the dealer's curb uh, as to what's going to happen to it uh, through at least the first you know transaction after the, the you, know, you know the first used transaction I should say the, the more used transactions there are you know farther up with the same car the less they're concerned but it ultimately if you if you're glutting the market as a manufacturer, which we saw, you know, not that long ago, everything's under control now, we think, um, and you're just driving down your residual values. The customer knows that. Uh, they're buying a car because, you know, they think it's okay, I can't pass this up, but I'm not happy necessarily with the car. And so that just goes right to what you end up as uh, charging for the new car. If that used car has terrible residuals and it has a terrible low price, then the new, the, then the transactional price on the new car is going to have the same problem. So that's why uh, automakers, even though it seems counterintuitive that they're interested in the used car market, they have to be because it's affecting their new products. And I imagine that, uh, uh, Ron, that a change that we've seen too is if you go back just a few years ago, it was hard for a lot of people to get a loan, and that seems to be loosening up considerably now. It, it has. Well, a couple of things. You know, first off, there's more lenders in the marketplace, which certainly helps create some competition. It's always good to see, especially some of these big banks coming in and uh, giving. And it's all good news for the customer. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's a you know, more competitive marketplace means lower interest rates and uh, you know more flexible buying procedures, but. This leasing, you know, I just can't, you know, all the stuff you're talking about certified pre-owned, the leasing has got to be a, a good natural balance between, you know, our portfolio that we offer our customers. And now, finally, with more sources in there, the residual values are getting higher, uh, which means there's less depreciation, which lowers the monthly payment. There's more banks in the marketplace. That means there's more financing available, which the money factors are lower, interest rates are down. So you get those combinations together and you can get, you know, with a good product introduction, a good, strong reputation of that product line, strong residual values, and then you're able to offer some very affordable alternatives to you know, long-term financing. So then all of a sudden we get these customers every three years, and it's, it's, it's a very healthy balance when we can get this, the average uh, you know, term less than 60 months. You know, when you're at 60 or you know, in some markets are at 72 months, uh, you're never going to see those customers. They're, not, they're never going to see equity in their car until six and a half years. And it's, you know, when you have those customers every three years trading in and on that cycle, it's, it's healthy for everybody.
Isn't part of the, the change, too, that we're seeing the banks now give loans to people who are subprime? Maybe not bad credit, but certainly not rock-solid credit. Well, here's the other change is that, you know, subprime, gosh, when I was a youngster in the business, subprime, you'd be paying 26% or 28% for a, a loan. You know, subprime now, in some cases, is 13.5%. So, you know, it's still, again, much more still affordable. Still high, it's but maybe still not. Still high, but not as prohibitive as at 26%. So... You know, risk-based risk pricing. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. So it's, you know, with the, as the conditions improve and become more healthy and the, the rates are, are down right now, historic lows, it definitely makes it, uh, the comeback is a lot quicker with the lower rates. There's, there's our, our opportunities for advancement are much better now with the lower rates. Mm -hmm. Well, Ricky, so. let me ask you, I was at a conference uh, a while back where you were talking about the uh, apprehensions of, longer term loans for used cars. Uh, y y there is a point of no return that right. a banker or a finance company does not want to cross because it is a used car and you're going out there kind of long to bring these monthly payments down low, but w w what are some of the risks involved in well, that? The risk is if you've got too long a loan out there, is there going to be any life left in the car at a certain point? So let's say you start with a, a four or five year old used car and you want to do a five-year loan, that's a 10-year used car. How much life is left in that car? Is it still going to be running at that point uh, that, that the consumer is still going to keep that car and, and, and keep making that payment? The other side of it is how long can you stay in that loan and not be what we call underwater? So you, if you're underwater too far, you can't go back in and trade because the day of being able to roll that extra money that you still owe on that car into the new one is, is a little tougher. Yeah. And that's the one thing that's not changing is the advance. The banks are very staying very firm on the advance. Well, what's the advance? Well, uh, as Ricky was saying, is that on a say a five-year-old used car, you're going to be uh, trading a car in that, and you're upside down by two thousand dollars. So you have your purchase price plus your taxes and all your fees, less your down payment plus your negative equity from your trade. There's only so much money a bank's going to advance on that car. So and they're not, you know, the rates are getting better. They're buying a little deeper as far as a little bit more high risk, but they're not advancing more on the cars. So they're staying pretty firm on how much they'll loan on that car. And that's mm. something that's changed in the industry here lately, as far as you know, Black Book dealing with various lenders, is we're seeing that they want to know more about what's the risk on this brand, what's the risk on this model, what's the risk on even down to this trim level of car. You know, do we want to take that chance and have? a certain number of this particular vehicle that's got a higher risk because of depreciation levels in our portfolio. So the lenders are being even smarter, just like the consumers are, just like the dealers are, the lenders are being smarter as far as knowing more about that life of that car and what it's going to be worth. There's also an old axiom, uh, when the uh, car stops running, the payment, payment stops, stops coming in. <laughs> so if you're giving a loan on a 10-year-old car, you know, there's some rust in that. Yes. And yet, uh, the average age of a car in the United States today is 11 and a half years, I think. You must be seeing some very high mo mileage models coming down the auction lanes. And, and that's what we're seeing right now is the, the age of the trade-in that's coming back in at the dealership is, is two or three old years older than it used to be. So now we're seeing a, a six, a seven, an eight, and nine year old car being traded in because those people stayed out of the marketplace for, for two or three years during this tough time of where we were at 16 and a half, 17 million new car sales and went to 10 million new car sales. Those people that stayed out are now coming back in by necessity or by desire, one or the other. But yet there, it's an older car, higher mileage, maybe a type car that the franchise store doesn't want to keep because of available financing or it fits more in what we call a buy here, pay here type level. So that, that vehicle is getting sent back to the auction in a little more uh, volume. And I, and I think that's a potential case that uh, can go back and even tie into a little bit of cash for clunkers from several years Absolutely. ago. Well, well, we know who's trading those cars in. Who's buying them? Who is the consumer? that is buying that old of a car? Was that somebody that has typically bought an old car? Or is there now an expanded group of people that are doing so? It, it's the typical buyer of that old car that, that could, can afford a very expensive car that you know, really is looking for a car if it'll just run for a year. That's good. And typically they fit in the buy here, pay here type segment of the industry. Um, and, and because of one reason or another, uh, you know, tough times economically or whatever, and there's more people in that segment now because of the economic issues. But it's, it's the person that typically buys an older car like that. 
So how does that run long term? Because we've got these very high mileage older cars than we've ever seen before. Uh, people's incomes, by and large in this country, have flatlined for about a decade now. Are, are, are we going to see a change where this is the new normal, to use another cliche that's being tossed around so much? Ron, how do you see it? How is this I, I going to work out long norm. term? I really do. I, I think it's going to, you know, this, we are seeing a lot, of, you know, as, as we mentioned here, we see a lot of these cars coming in at the new car dealerships that are six, seven, eight years old with 100, 150, up to 200,000 miles, they're, and they're trading on new cars. So, and, and a lot of dealers are holding on to those. They used to just wholesale those automatically to the buy here, pay here's. Now they're holding on to them for a little while. A lot of dealers are offering buy here, pay here because it is a much larger segment of our, of our business. Um, and, and I think what's gonna happen is that eventually is, you know, these now this next trade cycle comes with the lease turn-ins. The dealers will start getting back that three and four year old car and they'll have more of those available and less of the you know old high mileage cars and it's just it's just kind of a cycle that's going to go through that's just a natural transition of the marketplace and it's not going to remain you know the cash for clunkers took a lot of those cars out of the you know, that's the the good news bad news right now is that you know for the first two years after cash for clunkers there was none of those cars in the marketplace and all these people that would traditionally buy these cars whether it be because of a finance situation it might be a second or third vehicle for a kid or you know, they were gone. There was nothing out there. They were all taken out of the marketplace. So now we're starting to see a, you know, kind of a, kind of refill this, the shelves on those type of cars. But they're going to again go away once this big uh, bulge goes through the hose. And the ones that were left in the marketplace that were a two thousand dollar wholesale piece became a four or five thousand dollar wholesale right. piece. Right, right. <laughs> the prices just went up. Exactly, just because of supply of that, yeah. and mm -hmm. there was a need for that kind of car and that price car. Automakers are arguing right now that they're going to be able to sell small entry level cars. Uh, the Chevrolet Spark is one that comes to mind. It's, uh, I think the base price is around $13,000. And I, I asked Chevrolet, why would somebody buy this car instead of buying a used car at the same price, but loaded up with everything? And their answer was, well, because that old car probably doesn't have Bluetooth, it doesn't have the connectivity, it doesn't have a nav system that especially younger people are looking for today. Do you guys buy that argument? Are, are are especially younger buyers going to buy these new small cars rather than a loaded up used one? Partially buy it. Mm -hmm. Partially buy it. Why so? Not, not completely. Well, look at uh, somebody that wants a car that's got full warranty. They think, hey, there's, there's no worry there. So there's the new car buyer right there. The other thing is, look at how they're equipping that entry level car and that compact car. It's got some of those features now that you would never have seen on an entry level car before. So it's a better equipped car, so yes, it does. But the person that wants a little more comfort, leads a little more space, then their next step is that used car of a, of a next step up size. Hmm. Well, we've discovered that it, 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 the used car buyer and the new car buyer, it's not as binary as that. Somebody could be in the market looking at used, looking at new. They might be looking at a used luxury car versus a new non-luxury car and not sure which way they're going to go. So. Um, it's, it's a very um, intermeshed market as to what car that person ends up buying. But I, I sort of understand General Motors' point. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, the, the new cars have all the gizmos and things like that, and especially if you're appealing to a young buyer, they're going to want that stuff that might not be in a used car. But I always, you know, they, they talk about like Scion being the, the Toyota youth car, and you know, they have the, the whole division with Scion, but everybody seems to have their youth car. There is a youth car, and it's been that way for generations and ger generations, and it's called a used car. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, I thought consumers these days having the internet and things like uh, Black Book and Wards available to them knew exactly what they wanted going into a store. Can, can you still sell, or are you just pushing paper to, mm -hmm. to satisfy what they've already pre-sold themselves on? Well, um, yes and no. Um, we, there's a certain part of our business that's a commodity business that the customers that are using the internet as a tool and they want to use it to the, the final purchase, there's a part of that and they don't want that relationship. But for the most part, at the end of the day, the customers still want to make sure they're buying from the right person. They got to come into the dealership. They've got to, they've got to feel the car. They got to touch it, taste it, smell it get a feel for it. And then on top of that, they want to make sure they're dealing with a reputable dealer. So they want to come in, get a relationship. 
because it's not just the sale, it's the service. They're going to spend a lot more time in the dealership servicing them the, their car than they are buying it. So they want to make sure that the service department that they pick is going to be honest and they're going to be tr trustworthy and transparent and it's going to be available to them when they want. What kind of amenities do you offer, rental car, toll, you know. They want to make sure the whole package is there. So we're finding that there's probably 10% of the customers that could be happy doing it all through the internet, but 90% of them still want to come to the dealership. They're anxious to make an appointment and come in and, and, and drive the car. Hmm. You know, Ron, I saw a story the other day that said people were, were doing the research online, basically making up their mind online, coming into the dealership, saying, I want that car right there, never taking a test drive, and then coming back a month later and say, well, it really didn't fit my needs. I don't really like this car. But do you, you require them to take a test well, drive? Well, we, part of our sales strategy is, you know, that's great. And here's the beauty of it. We recognize as an organization, again, the whole purchase funnel in the olden days, he'd come up at the very top and they didn't know what they wanted and the salesperson would be bouncing from car to car to car and answering. It's not the case now. Now 90% plus of the customers that come in the dealership know what they want. So they come in and, and, and uh, it's not just strictly a, a price commodity thing because all of a sudden they figure out that they see it side by side with the next grade, the uh, next trim level that's available and they decide they want that, that's going to satisfy them more. Or, or they see a car completely different that they didn't expect. That's sitting next to it in the showroom, they get in that and might solve it. So there's a lot of that go, that goes on is that, and it has to happen at the dealership. And if the dealers are smart, they recognize this fact and they go to work right from the time the customers walk in the door and they make it a fast and transparent and expedient. They have the car ready for them. It's, they make an appointment, they know, they pull it up, they have it isolated. They, they do all the things to make it quick and easy for the customers. Yeah. And, and with that, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. This was a great discussion here, and uh, I'm afraid that we've come to the end of our time. But Steve Finley, Ron McEacher, and Ricky Baggs want to thank you all for having been here and want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by... Did you know advanced high strength steels are the leading material used by automakers to achieve the new fuel economy standards? Advanced high strength steels are lighter in weight and reduce greenhouse gas emissions without compromising safety, performance, or affordability. Steel, a sound, sustainable investment. Today, tomorrow, and beyond. For more information, visit autosteel.org. Why? Because plants need water to grow. Because baseball's played in the summer. Oxygen and hydrogen. Because I forgot to get a receipt. Why? Why not? Why? Why don't you go ask your dad? Do Sonata drivers know something you don't? The Sonata from Hyundai.